Hello, everyone, and uh, welcome back to our English literature course. We are approaching the end of the semester, so probably three, four more co uh, classes to go. Uh, we're speaking about the Victorian age, and last time we finished with two important names in the literature of the Victorian age, Charles Dickens and Thomas Hardy. Now, when we speak about the Victorian novelists, we always also speak about female novelists, women who were also writing novels at that time. And it's, again, very interesting if you follow the development of English literature, how in old English we had basically no women, not even generally as characters in, 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 in the texts, in the poems. They were playing minimal roles. And then in the Middle English, we, we had more and more women, but generally as objects of desire, remember? And then um, women started to appear more, despite the fact that in real life, women, in a way, I, it's wrong to say they didn't write or they couldn't write. They were not allowed to write. They were in a society that was training them to be at home, to stay at home, to take care of the kitchen, to make sandwiches, to be barefoot, pregnant, and all the time at home. They were not allowed uh, to go out more or less. For example, during the time of Shakespeare, women were not allowed to be to perform on stage. And men would be stealing the jobs. Okay, So basically, uh, Afra Ben is the first major real uh, uh, female writer. And that's why uh, uh, Virginia Woolf praises her a lot and says all the women around the world should put roses around her grave because what she did is significant for women in England and around the world. So she, w she was speaking for women. She was empowering women. She was showing women in a way how to do it and that they can do it. They can write and they can write better than, uh, than men. And then we move to see um, uh, Mary Vance, Mary Manley, and those uh, uh, fantastic female female women. And now we have women who can uh, 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 be published, and people were looking forward to reading their their stuff. But as a matter of fact, I always like to sh to show the role of women in fiction. So these are real women, real human beings with feelings and emotions and everything and lives. But in fact, fiction played a major role in the development and empowerment of women. And it still plays this significant role. And here for us, for example, like, a, like a, the Palestinians as occupied, as colonized, as oppressed society, we can always use uh, fiction as a tool of resistance, as a tool of empowerment to speak out, to reach out to, to others, to speak uh, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to, uh, truth to, to power, as, as they say. So fiction played an amazing role, fiction which is imaginative writing in empowering, changing the reality of, of men. And I can go as far as the nun and the wife of Bath in, in Geoffrey Chaucer. Chaucer, the woman in Chaucer was powerful, was different. She was untraditional. She wasn't, you know, the woman who was following the rules of the community. She wanted to challenge these, these roles. And even Portia, like centuries later in Shakespeare, can be a fantastic example for, for women. But what Portia did is, is you know, in so many ways, like what women do now in the 20th century, because at that time women were not allowed to be you know, on stage, let alone to, be, to go to university and be lawyers. So what Portia did is just she disguised as a man, changed her outfit, put a fake mustache, a fake beard, probably a fake wig, and now, whoops, all of a sudden, She's a lawyer, and she's defeating the most cunning character, Shylock. She's defeating, defeating him, tricking everyone in the court, showing us that all these man-made rules of the society that say women can't do this and can't do that and should be doing that, they're fake, they're fabricated, they can be challenged, and they can be broken. So we move to the Victorian age here, and we see how women were pushing the barriers like even uh, 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 further and, and further. Doesn't mean women don't have challenges. And people were not, in a way or another, hindering women's progress and writing. Even today, and I mentioned this before, when we spoke about J.K. Rowling, we said she used her first initials, J.K. Rowling. Her name is Joanne, and I usually say Joanne Khamis uh, Rowling, you know, my joke. Thank you for laughing, one mark for you. So. <laughs> Uh, J.K. Rowling wanted to be published, wanted to be published, 
she, she was looking for a publisher, and then they came up to the agreement that, wait a minute, maybe, maybe if we publish under your real name, Joanne, many people will not be willing to buy a book for a woman to read, although some of the most famous poets and novelists in the 20th century, 21st century are, are women. But again, the times are, are changing. So they agreed to go for J.K. JK Rowling, and we'll see this happening here. Women who couldn't be, uh, uh, like, uh, couldn't find the chance to be published would change their name, and women who wanted to reach to greater audiences to break the prejudice were also using pen names and fake names, uh, as we are going to see. So we'll speak about the, the three Bronte, Bronte sisters, the Brontes, the three sisters, and uh, we'll speak about George Eliot. Again, I say women writers, George Eliot. Because George Eliot, George Eliot is, George Eliot is a woman. She used the pen name of a man, George Eliot, for several reasons related to how women were. So the three Bronte sisters will take one text from each. Number one, Charlotte. Her most successful book is Jane Eyre. Don't confuse Jane Eyre with the real Jane Austen. John Austen is a, you know, the romantic Victorian figure, Pride and Prejudice, Sense and Sensibility, and Jane Eyre is Charlotte Bronte's most famous uh, 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 novel. In this novel, again, we'll see how these women generally write about women to empower women, and they are different. In the past. For uh, Henry, with, I think in Henry Fielding and Richardson, they were writing how women are always the victim, the victims of female violence. violence. Women always die. Women always get raped. Women always, you know. But here, women have their own voice. They can speak up. They can challenge authority, and they can end up victorious and triumphant and and happy. So, uh, this is one of the most famous novels about a woman, Jane Eyre. Again. Try to read some of these in the uh, summer break. If you can't, at least watch the, the movie. Uh, now, Jane starts as parentless. She's a poor child like, like Oliver. But she doesn't end up in a way like, uh, like, uh, like Oliver, because the, he, she, uh, he, uh, Bronte treats her as a, as a woman, as independent, as strong, because in the book, Oliver is always a tool of fate. He's like a feather being blown here and there by by the way, but, but this woman, she creates her own destiny, her own life, and her own uh, future, bringing uh, about a, a, a happy ending. So despite all the sufferings, she is, uh, she ends up triumphant, independent, and a strong woman. So when she meets Mr. Rochester, who looks up his, who has looked up his wife in the attic, and it's interesting when the woman, when the man doesn't like his wife, she, he just says she's crazy. Okay, so this is something here. She, uh, this man locks her, his wife in the attic somewhere up in the house and uh, claims that she is mad. Maybe she is mad, but that's not my issue here. Maybe you read that and see how uh, is she being, like, is, is, is the truth being told about her? Is he mad? Why is, if she's mad, why is she mad? What is madness, right? What is madness? Is madness what you don't like? If I do something uh, that you don't like about me, you're going to say that's insane, that's mad. So the novel examines the many circumstances, many issues surrounding the life of women at that, at that time. At the end of the novel, like I said, Jane herself, the woman, is in control, is in command. Remember when I said women, uh, women writers usually use techniques to engage the, the readers, to yes. make them part of this? Here. She sticks her head out of the text of the book, and she talks to us, the readers, like directly. General. She says, reader, I married him. General. It's not the, like, generally, we, we, men would be chasing women, right? Coming after, running out of them, etc. But here, the woman is in command. So, and this shows, again, a new move towards freedom and equality, that women are equal to men, and they can be in a position to uh, to chase and be independent and control their own destinies and, and lives. Jane Eyre, really interesting read. More about Jane Eyre. So, like I said, Jane controls her own life despite the difficulties, despite the suffering, despite the problems. 
at the end of the text, we see her as a strong, independent woman. Strong, independent woman. A strong, independent woman. And always compare this with how women are generally depicted by men, especially by 17th, uh, 18th century uh, authors like Richardson. Remember Pamela? Remember uh, Clarissa? Clarissa? Raped and dead. Raped and dead. Always victims. But this is totally uh, uh, different. The woman is simply independent of man. Not dependent on or upon man, independent of man. That's basically Jane Eyre. Uh, Emily Bronte, Wuthering Heights. Not sure if you're familiar with Wuthering Heights, Mutafat Wuthering. I think it was turned into a cartoon, but you will always find these on YouTube as, as movies. So Emily is a little bit different because she's more into the psychology, psychological novel. In a way, she was one of the leaders of the psychological novel where she gets inside the mind. And that's very beautiful and profound. Because if people believe that women can't write social novels, no, she, they can. And they can even write more advanced, more profound, more complex novels, novels that get inside the mind and the brain of, of the, the character. It's a novel of, of passion, considered to be an early psychological uh, example of, of the uh, novel here. The central character, character Kathy, or characters Kathy and Heathcliff, they live out there, they are in love. With the Withering Heights here are used in a way symbolically. Some, some people think that this is in a way partly a Gothic novel because it takes place among the, the heights of uh, the, the Withering Heights and the mountains and the hills and the, the valleys there. But the wild atmosphere, the geography reflects the passionate relationship between these two people. So in a way, it is mirrored that the landscape is as wild as the relationship. Of course, the, the novel is very original. It's very different in the way it's written, the fact that it's being, it is a psychological novel about the more what's going on here than anything else. For example, in the narrative, it moves backward and forward, like flashback, flash forward. It keeps going on like this. We mentioned a little bit about this in Mary Shelley's uh, uh, Frankenstein. Women always wanted to create new techniques because sometimes, like men, monopolize something. You know, monopolize, like, like they think this, this is my way. This is what women, what men do. This is how we, men write. And the women were like, okay, thank you. We can find a different technique to mix and vary, to create, to experiment on the narrative technique. So the novel, in events, moves backward and forward in time and in and out of the mind of the characters as a psychological, psychological novel. Let's see this extract here. So again, a new world, a new view of women and their emotions. They are independent and they can express themselves clearly and passionately as, as they like. Let's see Kathy talking to Nelly, her housemaid, about two people. Now, we know she is married to Linton, and she loves him. but she loves someone else. In the past, it was a taboo, like, oh, don't talk about this. You shouldn't. If you, if, if you get married to someone, you just, you just shut your heart and stick to this person. Look at this beautiful quote extract that changes everything about women in, in the English novel here. See, she says, someone read, please. OK, read. My love for Linton is like the foliage. Foliage. It's like paper. Foliage is paper. Time will change it. I'm well aware as winter changes the trees. My love for his cliffs resembles the eternal rocks beneath. A course of fated delight, but necessary nearly. I'm I'm Heathcliff. I'm Heathcliff. This should be. So Nelly, I am Heathcliff. Yeah. Always, always in my mind as my own being. Okay, so here we compare between the paper, the foliage, and and the rocks, the binary opposites. Yes. Like she's comparing these two people to these two things. These are similes, remember, as and resembles, mm -hmm. simile. This love is fake or doesn't last. It can easily be destroyed by some wind and rain, but this is strong as strong as the rocks themselves. If I ask you this question, what is the most important word in this extract? What is the key word? My love. My? Mine. My, where's mine? There's my? 
and my my love, my and my. What are these? They are, they are first person and these are feeling self. The self like generally owning something, some, something, possession here. They indicate possession, my, 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 my. So women in the past were properties. They were owned by men, controlled by men. Their destiny, their everything. But this is a woman in command. In my opinion, the most important word is the word own. My own being. I own him. He's mine. I can't claim him like people claim their, uh, you know, property or something. So there is the emphasis on my, 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 my. This is a, a strong, independent woman who can be in own command, who can own men, unlike a century or two centuries ago when women were, were on. So this is, again, interesting how women are writing, how these volunteers were writing about this. The sister Anne, Anne Bronte, their youngest sister, she also wrote about women issues. So for the exam, just with taking uh, uh, Emily and, and Bronte, but it's good to know that uh, Anne was also uh, writing stuff about the complex relationships between men and, and women. So, to, to summarize, everyone, to summarize here, the three sisters faced these problems. Some people say they, ref they were reflecting their own lives because they had this difficulty, the difficult life, and they wanted to write about about them to expose them to empower women but some might say that women always write fiction prefer fiction because they create their own world where you can live as a strong so if the society is not treating you well you can create your own world and this own world will become the reality if not your reality it will become the reality of other women and this is how empowering works sometimes they face these difficulties with courage and and directness Together, they changed the way the novel could present women characters. That's the most significant thing here. From now on, people, in a way, of course, we will find novels that treat women as, as, as uh, the case in the past, but generally people were pushing forward, especially women. After the Brontes, female characters were more realistic and less idealized. So the woman is no longer... Uh, an object of desire, although we'll find this all the time, but generally we will frequently find the strong, powerful, independent woman. Realistic, a woman, like not a superwoman, a superhero, and not an object in the kitchen. If we have this, it's usually criticized in a way, exposed in a way or another. This is significant. It's no longer a treated like, oh, come live with me and be my love, and we will all the pleasures prove where the woman is absent and silent, and she's tricked by, by things. So let's idealize. She's a woman. She has their own, her own faults, but she can be independent. She can survive all these difficulties and suffering. And their struggles became the subject of a great many novels. So the women are no longer minor characters or marginal characters. The book is about the woman. It doesn't mean because th these are women, they didn't write about other themes. They did. Yeah. Okay, but ma mainly they were aiming to empower. And let's see George Eliot or Mary again. I think we have Mary. 20 Jones and like 10 Marys, right? <laughs> Mary Ann Evans. Mary Evans or George Eliot? George Eliot. George, generally known as George Eliot, a.k.a. Mary Ann Evans. Name Sorry? Name. Yeah, not as much as George Eliot. And again, this is, a, this is a woman, I think, listen, the Brontes at some time in their life, the Brontes also used fake names sometime in their life. So it's not only George Eliot, the Brontes also used fake names or pen names or initials, so they didn't want to reveal that they are. Now with George Eliot, one of the most significant, some people consider the most significant female writer of all time. Even her book, her novel, uh, we'll see in, in a bit, uh, Middle March, is considered by many to be the greatest novel in the English language. Now, imagine this. You read a book, you look at the cover, and it says it's written by George, uh, George Eliot, and you love it. 
thinking that the author is a man. a man. If the author, if the cover says Mary Ann Evans, you're going to, I don't like read, writing, reading for women. I think women can't capture the essence of feelings and emotions and the experiences. Uh, many people say this. Women are not deep compared to men. Women can't reflect the psychology, you know, the relationship, the depth, the passion, the fears, the concerns. Many people say this, which is wrong, of course. Imagine yourself believing in this and promoting this and saying, women shouldn't be allowed to publish all poetry and, uh, uh, and, 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 and fiction by women uh, are mediocre, you know, mediocre, like average. And imagine yourself believing in this and holding a book that says George Orwell, reading the text, reading the novel, enjoying it, loving it very much, thinking that the author is a man. A man. And then someone tells you, excuse me, hey, George Eliot is a woman. What? Really? I don't believe it. I, I, can't, I, I can't believe it. Like, really? Because, I don't know, I loved it. You might say this and reconsider your position, like, oh, I've been fooled all this time by the rules, by the critics who are generally men. Yes. Or you might say, nah, I didn't really, really, really love it. I always felt somewhere in my stomach or head <laughs> or belly that this is not really excellent fine writing. But in a way, this is like, I usually like to say this, this is a slap on the face of those anti-feminists who look down upon women and women, women's achievements and women's uh, writings and, 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 and fiction. This is the thing, I, I love her uh, works, really, but I love this very much about her, the fact that she used a pen name, a pseudonym of a man, and then everyone is like, see, now this is the writing we should be reading, this is the writing that all the people should be imitating this man, and then all of a sudden, surprise, surprise, I am a woman. Breaking news. Breaking news, yeah? It turns the whole world upside down and inside out. It shakes the foundations of what? Of the English canon. It tells us that there's something wrong with the English canon. The English canon is biased, is prejudiced against people of color, non-white, non non-Europeans, outsiders in general, and women in, in particular. Women were kicked out not because they were uh, not writing good stuff, but because they were women. So she's perhaps the greatest woman novelist, and she used the name George Eliot to help her with the publications and, and stuff. Okay? She worked as a translator, then as a fiction. Now in the book, remember I told you this about Mary Wollstone something? What's her name? Mary Shelley? No, Mary Shelley, Mary Wolfstone something, Wolfstone Craft. Her middle name? No, her real name. Now, anyway, generally, if a woman is successful, in Arabic we say, Wala kulla rajulin azim imra. But here the book is telling us, Wala kulla imratin azim rajul. There is a, a great man behind every great woman. Sorry? Yeah, herself, a picture, a picture of herself. Nah? So what I'm saying is that the book here sometimes attributes the success of so, success of so many women to men. I don't like this. It could play some particular role. For example, with Mary Shelley, her father, her mother, they are taken out. They played a greater role in her thinking and, and, and intellectuality than her husband. But she is attributed to her husband. The same here, the book says, and I took it out, but I have to, to show you how this book is also prejudiced in a way. I love this book, it's one of the best. But we need to be careful when we read, read it. So it says, there was a man who, who encouraged her uh, to write, as if, if he didn't do so, she wouldn't be writing stuff. So she was, I took it out. I censored it. I censored the censorship. So she worked as a translator and then as a fiction writer. And though you're studying English, it's fun that you can be these things. And if you think of yourself as a, a, a translator, a writer, fiction. Her first novel is Adam Bede. 
uh, but she wrote more important works here. Uh, and her themes are generally, because, of course, she's a woman, so would usually be considered controversial. A, a women theme such as having a drunk husband. What's wrong with having a drunk husband? In, in well, what's uh, the mayor of Castle Bridge? Remember the mayor of Castle Bridge? What did the man do? He, he his sold his daughter. wife and daughter. He was drunk. And the book didn't say that this is a controversial uh, uh, book. Because the writer is a man and the critics here are men. But when a woman does this, it's controversial, it's objectionable, scandalous. scandalous. Yeah. Come on, for God's sakes. So I wouldn't, I should add some sort of uh, inverted commas here, like controversial. Who considers them controversial? Okay. So having drunk husband and being an unmarried mother, a single mother, okay? In her later novels, she writes about, of course, the society as a whole. For example, Middle March. Middle March. And Middle March is a fictional city. In literature, people generally, for example, you could write a, a story about Gaza and you just, the, play, the places take, the, the events take place in Gaza or Jerusalem, the eternal capital of Palestine, right? So, uh, or Cairo or London or New York. But some people make up names of cities for one reason or another. So they just say, I, uh, these events were taking place in, uh, I don't know, I can't make up a name of a country. Uh, pizza, for example. This place is called Pizza, where there are two million people living there. Ironically, no one loves pizza, and you just keep going on, on, on stuff. Because Gaza looks like a slice of pizza in a way. So. Uh, Middle March is a fictional character, okay? Sorry, a fictional place that takes, like the events take place in the center somewhere in the middle of, of Great Britain in England. Considered by some to be the greatest novel in English language. I'm sure the, some of these some or many of these some are women, like. The novel is set somewhere in the uh, 1832 uh, in a fictional town in England. The themes, of course, are immense. Like they go from the changes in the voting system. Women could not write until 1928 uh, something in England. But this woman was writing about this a hundred years before, well ahead of her, of her time. Talking about medicine, about that the rail transport and the roles of women in in the society in. Very, I, I generally give you an idea because this is the nature of the course. But sometimes I don't want to spoil the novel, you know, to tell you what happens at the end because I want you to go and, and see how things happen for yourselves. So this considers the importance of the dead hand of the past because the past should not, we should learn from the past, but it shouldn't be imposing its own rules and regulations because we are advancing in time in a way uh, or another. The, the, the heroine, of course, heroin, you know, not cocaine, heroin. The female hero is untraditional, generally. Her name is Dorothea, and, and finding her, she finds, of course, her own happiness and independence. Like, like most women, by women, women writers. Eliot's philosophy now, because basically Eliot believes in, the, in, in something called like or her practice, her philosophy is called positivism. You know, positive, yes. like you're optimistic, like the good is yet to come. Many people believe in this. Like the good, they generally focus and look at the half full of the cup, rather than the half empty. The so, okay, the bright side of, of things. And many people are dark and negative. The pessimistic, they say, if this is bad, what's come? It's worse. it's worse. There's this scene with, uh, with Homer Simpson and Bart, and Bart saying, this is the worst day of my life. And Homer Simpson telling him, yet, or so life. far, like the worst is it's yet coming. to come. But she believes in this. I think he, she being a woman plays a, a major role here. Because men are always playing the role of the victim, like it's dark, it's sad, we're suffering. And they are, in a way or another, victimizing women. So this woman says, no, don't believe these women. Don't, men, don't believe Hardy. It's going to be good. 
especially the roles of women, and women are advancing in an in amazing way that they can claim their, their role. So Eliot's philosophy is called positivism, meaning basically that humanity continues to move forward, to improve, to advance, to progress. Sometimes the progress is hindered, sometimes the progress is slow, but eventually there's the progress. There's progress, and humanity will progress, and the good is come. yet to come. And bitter stuff, bitter things will come eventually. Okay, so these are uh, four female novelists of the Victorian age. The three Bronte sisters George and George Eliot. Do you have any question? No. Any comment? Please do ask or if you want to say something. Have you, have you ever read some like poetry by, by women, uh, uh, novels or stuff in English or in Arabic? And how, how did, you, did you feel that women write differently. Uh, do, you, do you like to know who the author is of a particular text before reading it or what? What, what do you care more about? The text or the author? Which is more significant? The text. The text. So if someone tells you, hey, this is an, an amazing short story or poem, I, you should read it. Do you say, okay, send it to me, or do you ask first and foremost about the author? No. Because by knowing the author, we will know the style of the Okay, writing. interesting. But also by knowing the author, you're going to limit your imagination. You limit your interpretation. Because we've seen with the thick rose, the poem could be about so many things. One of you, uh, or on the other group, said, the thick rose could be about guys on Facebook tricking women, girls like you, telling them I love you, I like you, or something, and then they cheat them, like they destroy their lives, because this is the, the worm, the invisible worm destroys thy life, right? And this, inter of course, William Blake did not mean this, he didn't uh, for, uh, predict Facebook, but we can relate. But if you just only focus on the name of the author, his life, how he lived, was he happily married, did he have kids, whether his mother-in-law was horrible, whether his father-in-law was horrible, whether he had a job, unemployed, whether he was... Generally, what I like to do here in, in my classes is that while I don't do this, I, I rarely say he lived, he was married, he had kids, because I don't care about this. The life of the author could be interesting. There are theories that focus mainly on the life and the circumstances and the social political circumstances and the, the philosophical ideas and beliefs and ideology of the author in order to understand the text. But many other theories say no. This could be interesting. It could be fun to know something about Shakespeare and his wife and his kids and everything. But the most significant thing is the text itself. There's a theory called the death of the author. Like not let's kill all the authors. It's like when the author publishes a book, once the book is published, he or she dies. Halas. They become, they're no longer authors and writers. The book they become readers. Because now the text belongs to us. Yeah. And because this is not only theirs. These ideas come from so many books and stories they read and, and heard from, uh, hear from experiences. And Many, and this is interesting because sometimes people for a long time would think that this play was written by Shakespeare. And it turns out that no, it wasn't written by Shakespeare. It was written by someone else. And also, what about texts that are anonymous? Many people think we can't understand a text unless we know the author. What about anonymous texts? What about anonymous texts? Can we understand them? Can we appreciate them? Of course, yes. And I usually do this in my classes. In one of my classes, this was one of the best experiments I did. I was teaching a poetry class, and I, I brought an Israeli poem by an Israeli Jewish uh, poet, uh, Yehuda Amichai, on Jerusalem. So I had like 40 students, and I got them 40, 40 copies. Half of them, uh, I, I told the first half that I wrote down, 
that this is by the Israeli poet Yehuda Amichai. And it says, on a roof, one of the best poems you will ever read. Really beautiful. And the other group, I didn't tell them anything. Just, this is a poem, this is a text. Read it, what do you think? So the first group, because they already know this, and because Israel is destroying our lives and occupying us and turning our lives into hell, many people didn't appreciate the text as a text, as a beautiful artistic creation, artistic expression. And they were like, ah, not well, he doesn't capture the essence, the depth of Jerusalem, and it's not this uh, uh, Palestinian poet because it's ours and everything. Interesting stuff. Very, very interesting. But the other group were more into the text itself and its beauty and its artistic value as, again, a literary creation, an artistic creation. And even, funny, some of them thought that this is written by Mahmoud Darwish, Samih Al-Qasim, or even Tamim al barghouti because it's a beautiful text. It describes Jerusalem in this beautiful way. So sometimes we have this prejudice. So generally, I don't like, it's good to know that the author, who the author is, of course, but if you only want to understand the text by understanding the, the life of the author, not good. There will, I'll post this on the Facebook group tonight. There was one author, I can't remember who he is, who said that I read the first paragraph, only the first paragraph of the first of the novel, and then I can't tell whether this is written by a man or a woman. In a condescending way, saying that, implying that it's very easy to tell the style of women. They have a particular way. Yeah, there are differences. Of course, there are differences. For example, I know only four colors. I just, these, I don't know many colors. But women know more. Like they, they know Fushi, Mushi, Nili, Batichi, Jamali, Shimami, Fagusi, like so many crazy colors. Okay? And, and about, about many other things, not about colors. Like, we're different. There's, you know, there are differences, but not in a bad way. Not that man is better or women are. Everyone is good in his or her own, her own, on her own way. I think the Guardian posted 10 openings from 10 random novels that I haven't read before. And there was a quiz, can you tell if this is a man or a woman? I did the quiz and I got seven out, out of 10. So I'll post the quiz and you try to, to see if you can tell whether the author is a man and a woman. And I want you to don't, don't just do, do it hit or miss. Try to really read the extracts, the first, just very short paragraphs and see if you can uh, tell if the author is a man or a woman. There are differences, but the differences are not in the sense that this is better. Yeah, there are writers who are better than others, but it doesn't mean basically all men writers are bit better than all women writers. Thank you very much. We we'll stop here. Next class, we're going to do to finish the Victorian age with Victorian uh, poetry. Thank you very much.